So today I'm going to be talking about um, the collapse of democracy, so going from 1928 to 1933, and how the, well, how the Weimar democracy slowly turned into the Nazi dictatorship. And I'm going to be just stopping right before the legal revolution of 1933. So, well, 1929, the Wall Street crash happened, and this obviously helped the Nazis. So how did it, how did it help them? Well, the Wall Street crash occurred, which meant that the value of company stocks and shares plummets in, in America and the American economy essentially collapses. This causes America to desperately recall all loans they had uh, from Germany. Now, a German industry is draining from their income and they can't function properly. Manufacturers are therefore forced to lay off hundreds and thousands of workers at extremely short notice. And by 1933, there were 6.16 million people unemployed. These, like, all these unemployment, like, these unemployment figures and all this unemployment leads to mass homelessness and starvation. And the Weimar Republic really can't take any action to, to help. Or rather, they're not willing to because they refuse to raise taxes because they don't want to appear unpopular. Um, also, the Nazi party capitalized on the desperation of people with propaganda, the propaganda ministry, well, not ministry, the propaganda department of the Nazi party, so Goebbels, um, saw that people were desperate and, well, they capitalized on this. Uh, they set up posters, soup kitchens, make speeches, and then, um, now stop in 1920, like 1929, 1930, well, the first elections after the Wall Street crash, they win 37% of the vote, making them the largest political party in the Reichstag. Now, prior to this, that had been the SPD. Well, what is the impact of the Great Depression? Because the Great Depression uh, followed the Wall Street crash. On German businesses, it um, led to a huge withdrawal of interest, uh, of investment, sorry. Which meant that by 1932, production levels had dropped to 40% of 1929 levels. And overall, around 50,000 businesses collapsed. Then on government spending, well, the government was only able to fund support to certain people, around 900,000. Now, keep in mind that there were 6.16 million unemployed, so obviously they, that was nothing compared to the real number. Also, uh, Chancellor Bruning was named the Hungary Chancellor because there was a lack of government spending and low wages, so there wasn't enough money to buy food, so hunger was quite common, and that's why he's named the Hungary Chancellor. Then we have German banking. Uh, in July 1931, the Danet, which is a, a major bank in Germany, collapsed. And by that point, several smaller banks had been collapsing, but the, fa the first major bank to collapse was the Dana in July 31. Then the workforce, in the winter of 30 or 31, there were around 1.5 million unemployed, and then by 1933, by the beginning, 6.16 million. So in just one year, you can see how uh, unemployment just um, exploded. And the living standards in 1932, um, they were around in Berlin alone, I think, uh, 200,000 to, or 500,000 unemployed, and suicide, no, 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 I'm sorry, no, um, I got it wrong, in 1932, there were between 200,000 and 500,000 homeless people, I got that word wrong, and suicide rate was, was around 260 per million, so 200,000 to, uh, between 200,000 and 500,000 homeless people, and around 260 people per million people um, committing suicide. Um, then in, in German politics, uh, well, the government met 94 times in 1930, but only 13 times in 1932. And in 1930, in the elections, Nassau had 107 seats and 18.3% of the vote. So that 37% must have been in 1932, probably in May 1932. So what is the social impact of the Great Depression? Because that was more of a general impact. Well, first, let's like, divide it into groups. First of all, the poor. Well, the poverty diets, um, diseases linked to poor nutrition and poor living conditions were on the rise. This included tuberculosis and rickets. A reporter named Huber Knickerbocker uh, reported the average meal was the average meal uh, was six small potatoes, five slices of bread, and a small cabbage. 
so clearly not enough to, to feed someone. Then, in, home, in terms of homemade, unemployed families constructed of rock shelters, uh, they built huge shanty towns in Berlin. Now, this was happening all over the world in America. This also was present, but in Germany too. Um, parks became homeless towns. And um, these camps, well, they got quite developed. I'm not saying that the conditions were good. By no means were they good. But they had uh, playgrounds, communal kitchens. So people try to make it as nice as possible with whatever they could. Then in terms of towns, well, towns that had suffered the most like were those who had depended on a single industry. Town families just could not produce their own food and many city dwellers became like were hungry. So kitchens were opened, some by the government, some by independents, but quite a few of them by Nazis um, to provide free meals for the poor and obviously gain popularity. Then there was a town called Brand Erbisdorf, which was a small town near Dresden, and was a center for class making. This is one of the towns I mentioned that depended on a single industry. By April 1931, 50% of the town was relying on welfare payments. They were receiving welfare payments and they couldn't function without them. And by that point, if you had been on welfare payments for um, two years or more, these would be cancelled. A round of a bit of extra facts, well, 40% of all factory workers were unemployed by 1932, 15% of the population received absolutely no benefits, and 60% of each university graduating class was out of work. They, they completed the studies and they left and they had no, no, no jobs. Then have the, the young. Well, juvenile crime convictions did not exactly rise, but the number of 14 25 year olds accused of crime increased. Just, they just weren't caught. Um, they also participated in violent disorder, especially in political demonstrations. Then unemployment, well, there was a huge rate of unemployment amongst young people. In June 1933 in Hamburg, it was found that 39% of, um, of all uh, male, employ male employment and 25.2% of all female unemployment were made by, were like young people and a lot of gangs formed as a result. Then, in terms of extremist political organizations, well, the KPD and Nasdaq had their own groups. But the KPD um, recruited from wild cliques. Hitler Youth and the SA uh, did offer employment, food, uniforms, shelter, and general enjoyment. So they gained a, a lot of membership. But, most young unemployed males didn't have that much of a, um, of a contact with political extremes. The membership wasn't stable, and yes, there were some groups for girls, like the BDM, but girls and young women weren't exactly involved. They were just there. They weren't, they weren't actively involved like the young boys. Also, in skills manual labor, uh, was in, in terms of um, compulsory uh, working schemes, Unskilled manual labor uh, was, was present, but the wages were way below the legal minimum, which led to many strikes from October 1930 and even June 1932. There was also voluntary labor schemes, uh, and they were, these people who participated were sent to labor camps for six months. And, but these camps didn't offer any vocational training or even um, permanent employment. And then in terms of women, well, they lost the equal right to work. When, uh, in May 1932, there was a campaign of right-wing parties to pass laws that permitted married women, civil servants to be to be dismissed. This article only occurred if the employment was in the if the employer was of the central government and if the woman had a uh, secure social economic status. And a thousand of these women were dismissed from the postal service. And this um, this was passed again in May 1932, but with the demobilization laws in the 1920s, same thing. Then uh, right-wing parties were, were against women in the workforce. Most right-wing parties, they formed campaigns against these double earners, and they helped pass the law of May 1932. There's obviously hate from both sides. Now, I'm not saying it was just the right-wing, the left-wing also despised the women workers. Um, Hilda Walter, she's a famous um, like, she lived at the time, 
in which she said that um, there was a really uncomfortable atmosphere for a working woman. And um, mo both sides of the political spectrum work as women employed, like women in employment, but especially the right wing. But both sides. And then the poverty diets, well, during the Great Depression, the amount of women in the workforce increased. However, the um, rate for men decreased. So, like, men became really, like, salty about it because how come more women are working but less men are working? They didn't think it was fair. So, um, all of this eventually contributed to Nazism and Nazism's rise. Now, what was the appeal of Nazism? And this can be divided into five, five um, areas. First of all, effective campaigning and propaganda. The Nazis were huge fans of this idea of negative cohesion, which is um, contradict, which the way they enforced this was uh, making contradictory left wing and right wing claims and winning groups of di like different, winning the support of different groups by unifying them against a common enemy. They also bombarded people with propaganda posters and pamphlets, which really used the swastika, striking images, and catchy slogans. So people would just, even though they didn't exactly support them, they had the posters in mind. The swastika was everywhere. And this was before they weren't even in power. Then the Nazis organized huge, huge rallies and, and marches, which impression, impressioned the ordinary voter. Uh, because of their like organization and sheer size in times of chaos. And fun fact, um, this is how they got the mother of Albert Speer to join the party. Just FYI. Um, they also made many vague promises, which really sounded appealing and like were difficult to criticize because how could you criticize if we're going to reduce unemployment? Well, that's great for the country, you know, you can't, you can't, um, you can't exactly criticize that, so they got a lot of support from this, and these were published in the 25-point program, although this was written in the 1920s, or even the 1920 by Anton Drexler, but they, the Nazis used this, and obviously Mein Kampf, written in 1923. They also embraced new technologies, especially using the radio, uh, to spread the message. And by, by this point, they didn't use movies because by this point, um, the movies were under, under the control of the, um, of the Nazis because the Nazis weren't in power. This is before the Nazis actually got to power. Then also, um, the Nazis' principles were really fluid. Um, they had these policies that were vague and they felt they criticized. But as soon as any policy received criticism, they would remove that policy and make a new one, a new promise. Which, if it was popular, they would keep it. If it wasn't popular, they would change it for another one. Um, and this ensured they didn't lose a lot of support. Also, um, people were impressed by the smart uniforms and the cultural organization. I mentioned this before, the people liked this appearance of order and organization in times of chaos. Um, I don't know how relevant this is, but I'm just going to say it. Um, Albert Speer, who became uh, he was a Nazi like, architect, even part of the, in the like last part of the regime in the war. Well, he attended a university, uh, a Nazi not rally but a speech made by Hitler. And the fact that Hitler was was so um, he he was wearing a, like a really um, professional blazer. He was really organized. His uniform was like, he was more uniform. His suit was really. Professional, you know, and he was impressed by that. He was impressed by how eloquently Hitler spoke. He was impressed by how, like the things he said, the way he said them, and not all like what his friends had. I mean, his friends, but the idea he had built up in his head of this like politician, you know, well, it it exceeded all his expectations, and he actually rushed to join the Nazi party. And then, like I mentioned, well, uh, with his mother, his mother, um. Well, she was walking on the street and saw a group of SA marching in front of me. And she said, oh, I've got to sign up to this party. They're really organized. So she would rush and join the party. And also, they didn't tell each other that they had joined the Nazi party until later on. So that's a fun fact. 
Also, uh, Hitler, like I said, he traveled, he gave speeches all around Germany. Um, one of them being in where um, Speer was. Well, um, he went by plane, so he could, uh, first of all, he could reach the most number of, like, the largest amount of people possible. And also, it would give the appearance that Hitler really cared and, like, tried to talk to people. And it does produce a psychological effect that if someone, if a politician goes to talk to you, it it seems like they care. Also, um, the Nazis won the support of many important people, especially big businesses, and this helped them gain the support of ordinary voters. For example, um, in the recent American elections, uh, say Lady Gaga, she um, supported Biden. Now, if you were an undecided voter but really liked Lady Gaga, and you saw that she was endorsing Biden, you would then vote for Biden because if you trusted her judgment and you were going to vote for him, well, you would say, hey, why not? And th this is how they got a lot of their support using this big businesses who endorsed the Nazis and promoted them. And then a lot of people who were undecided voters who supported these industries, they voted for the Nazis. And then another, like, one of the factors that led to the appeal, like, the rise of Nazism, was the effective campaigning of propaganda. The next one being the failures of the Weimar Republic and Weimar politicians. Now, this style in the back maze had become really, really embedded in Germany, and this during the Weimar Republic and um, the November criminals were, were signing the Treaty of Versailles and crippling Germany in, the, in World War I and everything that went wrong after that. When Gustav Strassmann died in 1929, foreign minister and former chancellor, well, this meant that uh, people uh, took faith in this grand coalition of political parties, one of which the SPD formed part of, but uh, this soon collapsed, and people lost faith in that. There were also many, way too many parties in the, in the Weimar Republic, which bickered and really failed to cooperate with each other, so that wasn't good, that, that just stopped things from going through. And this meant that there were four national elections between 1928 and 1933. 1928 election, um, May 1932, November 1932, and um, 1933. So between February and October 1932, the Reichstag just did not meet at all. The people began to, to view their democratic institutions as, well, irrelevant. If the Weimar Republic, if the um, Reichstag was meeting, then why should they even have democratic institutions if they would just not work? Other, uh, politicians, the Weimar, other politicians in the Weimar Republic really underestimated the Nazis and they underestimated uh, how Hitler, who was uh, this uneducated man, could rise in power. So they just allowed them to keep on growing. If they had control of them, they possibly could have stopped them from rising. Also, um, the government uh, reacted to this economic cataclysm by reducing investment in public services, including education, transport, and housing. And in the short term, yes, fine, you reduce spending, but in the long term, this does not work out. Well, if you want to improve your economic status, you have to spend. You have to spend money to gain money. Um, the president, Paul von Hindenburg, especially after 1932, resulted in a ruling by emergency decree which really undermined the idea of democracy in Germany because if the president was just willing by emergency decree, well, that's just having that like a dictator. So why shouldn't there be a dictator? The logic is there. And this new chancellor that followed in the 1930s, Brüning, and even other influential polit politicians, von Schreiker, just didn't believe in parliamentary democracy, so they just didn't use it, and this really undermined democracy. Another factor which um, largely contributed to the rise of Nazism in popularity well, was this general desire for a strong leader. Well, people, people saw Hitler as a Christ-like savior who had come to rescue Germany in its time of need, and this wasn't helped by propaganda which propagated this Hitler myth. Well, Hitler was portrayed as a World War I hero who had been decorated in six occasions and while well, voters saw him as brave or loyal to Germany, this would do anything for the good of Germany. Not for himself, but for Germany. 
also he was a very charismatic public public speaker um like i said with Shpir, his his uh, ability to speak publicly really um captivated many in the audience and caused many to join the party Shpir. um that's how he joined well he practiced there's soldiers of this his voice his facial expressions and hand gestures to cultivate a more recognizable and um, powerful personal style. So even if someone, uh, say, is doing these gestures uh, that Hitler did, well, even though they weren't speaking German, even though they weren't, um, like nowadays, they weren't speaking German, they weren't even dressed as Hitler, you would know they were, they were imitating Hitler. And it's because he made this idea of, of being like really expressive, he used like the hand up in the air, facial expressions, he practiced these, there's photos, and it's just to make his image. And also, uh, the Hitler mustache and haircut, he was very recognizable. And yeah, that was became his symbol. And because this image was plastered everywhere and the speeches were good, well, people um, had the idea of Hitler stuck in their, in their brain. Well, um, most people really agreed with Nazis' nationalist ideology and didn't believe like, and believed that Germany should fight for their global supremacy again rather than appeasing the the victors of the war of the war because Germany had won the war. They just um they were just betrayed by weak politicians. Then. During Anna Chancellor's Muller and Brüning, there was really poor leadership in like in Germany. Even like Brüning becoming the hunger chancellor because of what I mentioned earlier. Hitler even promised to repeal the really unpopular Treaty of Versailles and restore Germany to its former glory. I mean, if you were a nationalist or like this national idea, you would say, "Hey, let's go for that guy." And while well, his ideas of an Aryan race and the Germans need like, the need of, for Germans to have Lebens around, well, provided really, like they were really, really popular, especially with these disillusioned Germans who believed and bought into the stab in the back myth. Then there was the whole hatred and fear of minority groups, which kind of ties in with negative cohesion. Well, the Nazis provided clear scapegoats for all of Germany's problems. Well, this just come with no surprise, but the Jews, the communists, and really any foreign power that had fought against Germany in the war. And some of Germany's um, politicians himself, themselves. Um, at first, the stab in the back myth was against Weimar politicians. Then it turned out that these Weimar politicians were Jewish, and then it just abandoned the whole Weimar politicians and just went against the Jews. So this policy of um, like stabbing the back myth evolved to go against it. became an anti-Semitic really fast. Then uh, many people resented Germany's Jews because they ran really successful businesses. So because they resented the Jews, they agreed with the Nazi party's anti-Semitic messages. And um, people really began to see the Nasdaq, Nazis, as a bulwark against the, the KPD, which had slowly been rising in popularity and the people uh, didn't want that. So they sided with the other party on the other side of the spectrum. So the KPD was extreme left, well, Nasdaq would be extreme right. Um, also, there was a lot of political violence from this point onwards, with 84 Nazi deaths and 75 KP KPD deaths. In the first six months, of 1932 alone. There were more, but just in those six months. And this really fueled Germans' um, fear of anarchism and revolution, and parties like Nazi capitalized on this and tried to calm these fears for their own advantage. Well, Nazis pushed paramilitary uh, wings like the SA, well, these used violence to intimidate the, um, the, party's, opponent, um, the party's opponents, especially um, communists in staged battles, so the SA members would dress up as communists and they would go into the street and start um, causing violence. Then SA in SA uniforms would march in and fight them and win the battle. And people saw this and said, oh my god, oh, 
and GSA are helping us, so we should vote for them. The, it, this is all completely staged. And um, those traditional order, older or rural Germans uh, felt who felt aligned by the Roman Republic, so the Van der Waal movement, uh, who despite art, architecture, nightlife, film, and music, well, they were drawn to Hitler's conservative ideology, so they voted for him. And then lastly, and possibly the biggest factor, is the impact of the Great Depression. Well, first of all, Nazis could have risen in power at any time, but they capitalized on the Great Depression and used propaganda well, against it. Well, German industry was really dependent on US loans, and when the American economy collapsed in 1929, well, so did the German economy. Industrial production uh, dropped 40% and millions and millions of, of workers were laid off. Most imports and exports uh, dropped, which meant that Germans can have basic essential needs. This included few, uh, food, fuel, whatever, literally anything. Basic still. Uh, Nazis, so to counter this and the kind of propaganda, they set up uh, hostel soup kitchens to help those homeless and starving in the Great Depression. By 1932, I mentioned this before, German unemployment had risen to 6.16 million. So in desperation, in times of need, people tend to, yeah, to go to the extremes, this time to the right. While married women in the work were resent in work were resented as double earners, and well, because Nazis if they advocated for traditional gender roles, their ideology became really popular, and yeah, this resonated with a lot of people and won the Nazis quite a few votes. And like I said before, the essay offered shelter, food, clothes to destitute young men who just wanted to give like their like just wanted to, to live and have a certain standard of life, but in exchange, they wanted the SA membership. So, those are five factors. And now the trigger factor and the factor that ultimately put Hitler as chancellor was the whole backstairs entry. So first we have Brunings government, the hunger chancellor. Well, chancellor. Well, um, Brunings could only really remain in office if he had Hindenburg's and Schneider's support. He reduced state expenditure by cutting welfare benefits, reducing numbers of civil servants, and cutting wages. So I mentioned this before, he became the hunger chancellor because people couldn't afford food. So then the next stage is Brunning's government collapsing. Well, Brunning decided it would be a good idea, and I get it, to ban the SA in April 1932. Now, von didn't like this and withdrew his support because he feared the Nazi party would uh, organize an uprising. So to avoid this, he just withdrew the support from Brunning's government. Hitler uh, then agrees to not oppose the new government if a new Reichstag election is called and the SA ban was, was lifted. Brunning said, please, can we just like not do this and um, can you sign a presidential decree, an emergency decree, Article 48. And was like, you know, why would I do that? So Brunning has no choice but to resign because he had lost Hindenburg's and Schleicher's support. Then we have von Papen's cabinet of barons, and this is the next stage. Well, Papen established a government of national concentration on a more non-political party basis. He did have the support of political parties, and by political parties, I mean just the DNVB, so extreme right. And even though like this happened, the DNVP only had two posts in the cabinet. Other positions, uh, other positions were filled by men who weren't members of the Reichstag, they weren't elected officials. So he was forced to rule by decree with very, very little support. The next stage is von Papen's actions in Russia. In, not Russia, sorry, in Prussia. Well, he believed that Germany's greatest threat was communism and sympathized with Hitler's ideals that, well, like the communists were on the rise and, well, he saw the Nazis as useful allies in establishing this government of um, 
national concentration. Like I mentioned before. Well, he lifted the Brunig ban on the SA in June 1932, so just two months after it had been po imposed. And he also imposed curves on left wing press. So, kind of a bit of censorship there. This meant that a huge amount of uh, street violence ensued, and especially during the Reichstag election campaign in July 1932. So, no, the elections weren't even in May, they were in July. And well, von Papen used these waves of street violence as an excuse to impose a more authoritarian rule in Prussia, which is uh, Germany's largest um, area. So yeah, the elections were in July and November 1932, and these are the next step. Well, moderate party, all moderate parties except the CCP uh, suffered losses. So SPD, um, DDP. DVP and the NVP. The KPD and the NASDAQ, not that much, and the CCP neither. And the political scene became much more polarized. So DVP, DDP, and the NVP, these became, these lose, lost support and they either flocked to the center or to the extreme. That's it, just either right in the middle or right at either side of the political spectrum. Nazis became the main right wing party because the DNB, the DVP had lost a lot of support, the DNVP also had lost quite a bit of support, so the only main right wing, right -wing party left was NASDAQ. But they failed to gain voters from the CCP, from the SPD, from the KPD, so they didn't have total control by this point. Hitler was invited by von Papen to join the government in July 1932, but Hitler said, no, I'm not going to do it, because why should I? He didn't want to. He says, "If I want, if I want to join a, um, a government, I want to be chancellor." Hitler had an agreement with El Schreiker, which he broke because, surprise, surprise, Hitler doesn't keep his words, and joined with the communists uh, to vote, pass a vote of no confidence against von Papen and his government, which was passed uh, with five hundred twelve votes to to forty two votes. Von Papen, as a result, was forced to dissolve the Reichstag and call for new elections. November. And in, in November um, 1932, new elections passed, but Nazis, they lost quite a bit of support. They um, went from having 230 seats to ju just 196. And this is because Hitler's attack, attack on von Papen had cost, um, had cost him the support of the middle stand. And push them more to a more push them to a more moderate way of like moderate right. So DVP, DNVP. Also because Nazi supported a transit strike by communists, uh, that didn't help with those in the right wing. And Nazi funds at this point were exhausted. And now we have the next stage in which Von Papen's government collapsed. He wasn't even a candidate in the November election. Uh, because even though his government faced a Russian majority, he was losing, um, well, his government, well, his government was facing a Russian majority, so he, he, his government wasn't part of the Russian majority, if I got that wrong. And he was also losing credibility from the army. And I mean, obviously the vote of no confidence did not help. <laughs> um, he even considered straight up banning the Nazis and the communists, so the two extreme groups, but decided not to, um, because well, yes, he wanted to create an authoritarian rule, but Schleicher, he, he said, well, you can do this, but you are going to lose the army support, so I suggest you don't. And Von Papen had no choice but to resign. And here comes the next stage in the Wachsler's intrigue, which is uh, von Schleicher's government. Well, Schleicher persuaded Hindenburg to, to appoint him as chancellor. He prepared to influence behind the scenes, but also the fact that he had been alienating von Papen slightly made Hindenburg view von Schleicher with a bit of suspicion. And uh, he had lost Hindenburg's trust. And Schleicher knew that his only chance of success was forming a coalition with the Nazis. But they refused to, to like, collaborate with von Schleicher. So Von Schleicher now had the impression that he had overplayed his hand. 
but all was not lost. He began negotiating with Gregor Strasser, but was but eventually was cleared from Nostap. Now there are two Strassers, I don't wanna I was confused at first. You have Gregor Strasser, which is this guy. He was the head of the more left wing side of the National Socialist Party. And then we have Otto Strasser, which is more of a radical Nazi right wing party. I think they are related. I think they are brothers, but I may be wrong there, so don't call me to that. Well, Schleicher began this new progressive social policy in hopes to bring support from the trade unions because he needed a bit of support from the left wing because he just... He had been to collaborate with Strasser, but that failed. Then he needed a bit of support. I mean, the right wing, he had exhausted all possibilities, so why not try the left wing? However, um, well, landowners and industrialists uh, stopped supporting Walsh Schleicher, and this is because he cancelled uh, von Papen's cut in wages and broke large estates to distribute to small farmers in order to gain this more left wing support. But this cost him the right wing support. Well, Schleicher and Hindenburg, well, in Chancellor and, and President, Hindenburg didn't really trust Schleicher. So Schleicher one day, he went to after Hindenburg and said, hey, can you just like dissolve the constitution and well dissolve the Reichstag and give me dictatorial powers, please? Because I want to be a dictator. And Hindenburg was like, why would I why would I do that? I know. Because <laughs> Schleicher just like Hey, can you make me a dictator? Obviously, Hindenburg was gonna say no. So when Hindenburg refused, or Schleicher, he resigned. And here we have the dodgy deal between Hindenburg, von Papen, and Hitler himself. Well, whilst this whole von Schleicher government had been going on, von Papen had been negotiating with Hitler to form a coalition government under certain conditions. The DNP was even prepared for a Nazi led coalition, and then they would go on to join the Nazi party. Well, um, Papen, Hitler, and Hindenburg's inner circle, inner circle made a deal uh, for a coalition government that put Hitler as chancellor. Because Hitler said, "If you're gonna make me, like, if you're gonna involve me and my party in the coalition government, I want to be chancellor. Otherwise, any collaboration is off the table." But the way Papen sold this to Hindenburg, saying he was like, "Well, Hitler would not have a free hand. He's this uneducated person." I'm just going to stay as vice chancellor and, and um, control him, kind of. And your son, well, Hindenburg's son, would be the Minister for Food and Economics. Also, there was a uh, restriction to only three Nazis in the cabinet, which included um, um, Goering. Goering was, was one of the three Nazis and was also the president of the Reichstag because his party was the largest one. And it was believed that Hitler would be easy to control because he had no real experience in politics. He had just found this party which hadn't had that much success in mainstream politics, but also he didn't complete his studies. So, well, he is just a random guy. I mean, anyone can control him, right? Well, officially on the 30th of January 1933, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany by President Paul von Hindenburg and held his first cabinet meeting. And that is how Hitler becomes Chancellor. So, well, that is how Hitler becomes Chancellor. Now you need to know how he transforms from democracy to dictatorship. So, before I really get into the actual stuff, I'm going to give you a quick overview. First of all, you have democracy, in which Hitler becomes chancellor of the Republic. A republic. Democracy. So far, so good. Well, then we have the Reichstag fire, which as a consequence removes all uh, individual civil liberties and the communists. Then the Enabling Act uh, removed the Reichstag. Legal Revolution removed all political parties, trade unions, the church, civil service, and local governments. And the Night, night of Long Knives removed uh, internal rivals. And Hindenburg's death removed the president. Although Hindenburg didn't die because of any suspicious things, he just died because of old age. This um, eventually removed Hindenburg, so Hitler was free to become Fuhrer. And then, after Hindenburg's death, Hitler officially becomes Fuhrer of the Third Reich. 
So, I'm going to get into a bit of detail. Uh, first of all, the Reichstag fire. This occurred on the 27th of February 1933, and Marius van der Lubbe, a, a Dutch communist, was convicted of doing the Reichstag fire. And uh, as a consequence, the emergency decree occurred. Now, it's debated as to whether the Nazis did the Reichstag fire, as was it the communists, was it just van der Lubbe? We don't know. Um, personally, because of Hitler's reactions, uh, I think it, Hitler was not involved in the Reichstag fire. I do believe, and many historians uh, agree, that it was the Nazi party, because Goering's office, well, he was in the Reichstag, and well, the Nazis had everything to win from this. So I do believe it was the Nazi party, but without Hitler's knowledge, because if they kept Hitler out of the, if they get if they kept Hitler in the dark, they could, he couldn't be blamed. So they decided to do the Reichstag fire, which when it was burnt, it was seen as a burning of democracy because the Reichstag was a symbol of democracy and it would help in making Hitler more powerful and in turn making the Nazis in general more powerful. So as a result, like I mentioned, the emergency decree was passed. This took away the freedom of expression, freedom of press, freedom to organize and assemble, the freedom of privacy of postal, telegraphic, tel uh, telephonic communication and the freedom for requiring warrants for house uh, searches. Well, these, well, warrants for house searches, orders for confiscation and restrictions on property are permissible even beyond the legal limits. And I mean, all of this shows how they took individual rights away. This was quite popular. Um, he convinced Hindenburg to pass the emergency decree, Article 48, and take away uh, individual rights. Then the Enabling Act was passed. Uh, by the way, the emergency decree was passed on the 28th of February, 1933, so literally the day after the Reichstag fire. Then the Enabling Act uh, was a law that gave Hitler the power to pass laws without consulting either the President or the Reichstag. And this was passed on the 23rd of March, 1933, and would last for four years. In theory, even though it lasted for just one year when Hitler became Chancellor, um, Fuhrer, sorry. This was essentially the Reichstag's way of removing itself for four years. Now, if you pass the Reichstag, you think, well, if we can't find, we can they can remove the Reichstag for four years, but who is going to recall the Reichstag? They passed this, uh, the 444 votes to 94 votes. Now, it's quite popular because of intimidation. Those 94 people who opposed this were the, um, the SPD, the 94 um, members of the Reichstag who agreed to this were the SPD and they suffered later on, especially in the Night of the Long Knives and in the Legal Revolution. And you have to note how, well, that doesn't add up. Remember, the vote of no confidence was more, like, averaged up to more people in the Reichstag. And, well, this is because Hitler, by this point, this was passed on the 23rd of March, Earlier that had the same month in the League Revolution, he had banned the KPD, so they can vote against it. So that's why the Reichstag isn't like the um, votes for the Enabling Act in the Reichstag doesn't add up to the number of seats available. And the Enabling Act essentially took away the parliamentary bodies and removed all political rights and yeah, and the Reichstag. And the next part, so the League Revolution, that is the Long Knives and Hindenburg's death, are in the Next module, which is um, the Nazi dictatorship. So I'm going to stop there. That is module three. And that is how, uh, how democracy was slowly collapsing. Because by the end of this module, you can see democracy is still there, but political and individual rights have been taken away. So it is well on the way of, like, the dictatorship is not far off. And you have to you have to be impressed by how quickly he did it. Hitler, in January thirtieth of January nineteen thirty three, he was just chancellor, and then August nineteen thirty four, he was dictator. So that's kind of impressive, if you ask me. But yeah, that is it. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope this was helpful. Bye.